The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anusha Sai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. Hope you're all well. Quite scary times we're going through at the moment with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. However, it has been encouraging to see the amazing support that's been shown for Ukraine against very aggressive actions from Putin. Let's hope we see a swift resolution and the aggressors are held to account. It's been a crazy few years, really, with Brexit, Trump, COVID, and now this. It's understandable it's been pretty hard for the cannabis industry to get off the ground with constant global strife. So let's hope for many, many reasons, not least cannabis, that things do settle down. As ever, this show is sponsored by our good friends at Lumino. Lumino are a boutique HR and recruitment company for the European cannabis industry. Our guests this week cover the worlds of alcohol and tobacco, which are both highly regulated industries. And experience in these sectors is really useful for cannabis for obvious reasons. Lumino has a great roster of talent with that kind of background who understand highly regulated industries. And that's whether it be branding or operations, just by way of example. So as always, if you need help with HR or recruitment, please do get in touch with them at luminorecruit.com and tell them that I sent you. Anyway, on with the show. Enjoy. I'm very pleased to welcome back a couple of previous guests. I am going to dub them the Princes of Vice. We have Shane McGill, who is Global Lead of Nicotine and Tobacco at Europe Monitor International. And we have Spiros Malandrakis, who is industry manager for alcoholic drinks at Euromonitor International. Euromonitor is a leading independent provider of strategic market research. Guys, welcome back. How are you doing? Thanks very much, Anuj. I've been called worse than that, I can tell you. <laughs> I take it as a great honor for me, and I, and I definitely embrace my title. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad. It's, it's got something royal in it, which is good. Yeah, no, look, there's loads of great stuff to talk about, and it's it's great to have you on. It's been too long. There's been a sort of niggly virus that's sort of got in the way in between, but we won't dwell on that topic. There's plenty to talk about from the worlds of nicotine and tobacco and, and alcohol. For those that didn't catch the original episodes, though, maybe we'll just start with a bit about individually. Spiros, do you want to have a, just a, a quick intro and say what you do and where your background is and what made you sort of get into the cannabis industry? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great way to start anyway. I think uh, great conversations tend to start with an alcoholic drink, or at least used to, and then the cigarettes follow later uh, for Shane. So we can we can have this kind of planning. Just a quick introduction for myself. I've been covering the global alcohol industry for the last 15 years now, um, covering everything from spirits to wine to beer, RTDs, hard seltzers, and obviously the latest generation of non or low alcoholic drinks that are in many ways adjacent to cannabis as well. It has been a very exciting time for me. And also it's an industry that allowed me to look at recreation and and entertainment and having fun without the blinkers or or the the taboos, if you wish, that some other industries might be looking at that, allowing me to have a much more open mind when it comes to the cannabis industry as well. About four or five years ago, as the, the green wave, if you wish, was hitting the US and I could see the first signs of the potential that was there, I started also looking, alongside Shane, we combine our sinful minds and we decided to start looking into the cannabis industry. We found some amazing parallels, each with our own industries, some great potential moving forward, primarily in my case was always because of the entertainment and recreational value of alcoholic drinks and the unashamed embrace of it. It was always more towards the other use side, something that might appear a bit further away from us here in Europe, but I still have really, I hold really strong opinions on the developments that happened in the last couple of years. And I do believe in in the opportunities for the next couple of years. And at the same time today, I hope we're going to critically assess the past and hopefully provide some opportunities and uh, dreams for the future. (laughs) Fantastic. Always a colourful introduction from you, Spiros. So thank you for that. Shane, your go. Yeah, so, you know, as Spiros said, I've been working in the market research field for about a decade now, initially looking at the tobacco and nicotine space, you know, which was more than enough on its own, I guess, a really sort of fascinating industry in its own right. But about five years ago, I started 
taking more of an active interest in, in legal cannabis. Again, initially from the perspective of, of what implication and impact, you know, wider legalization, wider normalization of cannabinoid products is going to have on, on the tobacco and nicotine industry, but kind of very rapidly in concert with Spiros, you know, realized that, you know, effectively, I think legal cannabis is much more important beyond even legacy industries, much more important than, than its impact just on things like tobacco and alcohol. And that if you look at all of the kind of wider consumer needs, trends, desires, the, the behaviors that consumers are exhibiting now, you know, all of those barriers to growth in, in traditional industries like tobacco and alcohol, you know, cannabis has the potential to kind of address those. And so, you know, the, the potency and the potential of, of that industry really interested us. And we, we brought that through together, kind of developed theses around, you know, again, how we saw the impact, where we saw the industry going in future, you know, really had to push that internally, I guess, within Euromonitor as well. I think initially when we started doing it, we were really regarded as as kind of having a screw loose in some ways. And, you know, we developed that within the company as well, I guess, you know, to cut a, a relatively long story short, right up to the point where we now have a, a syndicated cannabis product within Euromonitor where we're producing data on 20 legal cannabis markets globally and, and hopefully more in the near future, you know. So, and that sits alongside you know, every other industry that Euromonitor as a company produces data on, you know, AD, soft drinks, food, etc. So when you talk about, you know, normalization, at least within <laughs> our own little part of the world, Euromonitor, you know, cannabis is fully normalized now as a research product. So we're, you know, that's something that we're quite proud of, you know, irrespective of whatever else we, we do in our careers. I think that's something that, that both of us, you know, feel is an achievement. So yeah, you know, looking back on what we've achieved and looking forward as as Spiros says to what what else you know, and what the future holds for this industry. Well, yeah, we'll get into that in a second. Anyway, you're getting into a bit more on what you and Monster are doing as well, but it's very interesting. I usually ask, you know, the question of stigma and, and how you approach that. And interesting to see that, you know, you've kind of had to come across that internally in your own organization and, and it's changed. How have you kind of seen that, that evolve, that narrative? Well, I think what I find to this day particularly interesting is the stigma exists. We have to, first of all, acknowledge it. It was an uphill struggle. And while we have achieved that within our own company and the results are great and are only improving moving forward, when it comes to the FMCG industries and the mainstream, if you wish, industries beyond cannabis that could potentially be related or relevant to it, there is still a lot of hesitation and a lot of fear. I think when it comes to the, you know, the stereotype of stoner, where the stereotype of, of, you know, the limits of how cannabis can move and this kind of fear that potentially if we dip a toe in, it might come back to bite us because of reputational damage or at least perceived, or I would say, I would personally say imagined reputational damage. Whenever someone says that to me, when it comes from the alcohol industry, and I have to admit that they're increasingly becoming more open to that as well. I just have to ask them, has a, uh, ABI, through their collaboration with Tilley, or has Heineken that owns Lagunitas that has been selling a cannabis drink for years now in California, or Constellation, or owning the biggest uh, cannabis company in the world, has any of these companies had a single point in the last couple of years that that translated into any kind of reputational damage? And they just look back at me, you know, without anything particular to say, because it, it's not really happening. I think I think that this is primarily down to this disconnect between the upper echelons of some of these companies that are in the hands of people that tend to be sometimes of an older age or uh, older generation. They still carry this kind of legacy taboos of the past. They are trying to slowly open up, but in many cases, I think I think they have to be pushed from the bottom up from some of the younger people within the companies that are a bit more open-minded. Some people like us potentially keep on hammering on about the importance of cannabis. I think it, we still have to fight this battle. It is real, but we are definitely slowly winning the war. Yeah, I think it's an article that you guys both co-authored. We were talking about the end of the beginning or something like that, which kind of makes sense that, you know, it's now you don't have to kind of have that battle so much. Maybe it exists in the, in the world at large, but maybe some of the bigger corporates that are more relevant are sort of, have cottoned onto this and... and had a few years to get more comfortable with it. I think, you know, there is still reluctance and that exists in some areas. And some of that reluctance is even as kind of Spiros talks about this sort of taboo or almost moral in certain cases. And we do, you know, I come across that in clients sometimes. I've had a client say to me, everyone in the company wants to look at this, but the CEO is against this from a moral perspective and, and it's just blocking it, you know, 
but that's about sort of a generational thing. It's a personality thing and, and that will kind of allied over time. But yeah, I mean, we've seen a huge change again with the clients we deal with from, you know, back 2016, 17, even when we first started trying to have these conversations to now, it's, it's much more open. You know, people have this on their agendas. It may still not be the number one thing that's on people's priority list. And we still, you know, have to kind of struggle and battle a little bit for kind of mind share or share of people's focus from a client perspective. But you know, it's certainly much more open now than it, than it was when we began. And, it, you know, it's money, money talks as well. People see that this is on balance, perhaps going to be something that's more commercially valuable to them than commercially damaging. I think ultimately that's what it comes down to. And that's, you know, going back to the internal conversations we had, it was when the money started flowing in from clients that were interested in this topic. You know, that's what really changed people's minds internally was this is not something that's going to lose us money. This is something that's that's going to, pick it up for us so you know that's where people where the wallet goes then the heart and mind follows i guess yeah and i suspect that is going to be the argument that's persuasive more conservative governments including our own (laughs) at some point down the track but they probably don't want to be the first to to do it i think well i think the conversation of the political spectrum and its cross-pollination with cannabis i think it deserves its own separate question and segment in this conversation and especially when it comes to the uk so I don't want to preempt the next couple of points that we'll be making. But I, I, in my mind, to your comment, Anushan, I think I used to believe what you're saying. I don't anymore. In my mind, I, I understood that uh, it took me about half a decade, but I understood that politics is not about rationality and people's vote is not about rational decision. So in that sense, what that means is that it's not a straightforward decision that says that this makes money, ergo, we have to do it, or this saves us money as a state or as a you know, health institution, hence we have to do it. The arguments and the counter-arguments and the decisions have a very large proportion that of emotional decision-making and that the political forces that could potentially push for it or push against it will not and are not making these decisions purely based on rational facts and uh, you know conversations with PhDs. They look at it based on what kind of voter base they're uh, flirting with, how likely they will alienate them or not, and ultimately, definitely, ultimately, the inertia factor, which brings complacency. If things work as they are for the political party in power, there is literally no incentive for them to rock the boat, change things, as long as there is no someone actually barking at their heels, feeling the pressure, and then they have to start opening up to younger demographics, potentially then thinking of the kind of legalization discussion, all of that kind of stuff. So in other words, again, in the context of the UK, to the extent that it's not about conservative or non-conservative governments, really, it is if the government at the top is, is in, the, in our case, conservative for more than a decade now, and they see themselves as winning the next election, they have no incentive to make that change. Equally, the Labour Party, which is in opposition here, if they have had their panels and their internal discussions thinking that it's not a winner for elections in marginal seats, they will not, as Keir Starmer himself has come out and said, they will not push for any significant changes in the drug legislation. I thought it was just literally a, an accounting discussion. Is this making us more money? Are we losing more money? Is it working? Is it not? But as I said, I realized it's a bit more complex than that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I was simplifying it to something very crude. <laughs> it is a bit but more than just money. But cool. Thanks for that, guys. And look, we'll get into the main topic in a second. But Maybe you could do a brief sales pitch on you and monitoring exactly what you guys as an organization are doing in, in the cannabis space. I think you mentioned obviously some of the research that you're doing, but maybe you could tell us a bit more. Yeah. So from a, I mean, a Euromonitor perspective, I mean, I mentioned that cannabis is, is normalized within Euromonitor. And I guess that what means is particularly for our syndicated data products. So that's the, the sort of off the shelf data that we produce on about 30 different industries which makes up the majority of the, the company revenue. Cannabis is now one of those industries. So there is a passport cannabis system where we're producing data on medical cannabis, adult use cannabis and CBD in 20 markets where legal, you know, things like market sizing, format sizing, incidence of use, estimates of illicit value in those markets. We also are running a survey in each of those 20 markets as well. So we have what we call the cannabis survey, which again sits along other alongside other consumer surveys that we produce in Euromonitor. And that survey looks at things, again, such as incidence of use, you know, in much more granular detail, how frequently people are using, what types of products, what the drivers of use are, what occasions, 
uh, barriers to use, what features of products are most important, you know, all of those kind of consumer behavior aspects, but also looking at the wider kind of landscape in those markets, you know, questions to the general public around how they view cannabis, you know, attempting to track those things like how normalized or acceptable cannabis use is. We're getting some interesting results from those, you know, just talking about kind of the political process and legalization. So we're finding that in a lot of those 20 markets, there's a lot of acceptance around the inevitability of wider legalization of cannabis use, which is kind of surprising to us, like big majorities of the population, whether they agree personally or not, are saying that they're, you know, they see wider legalization as kind of inevitable within their lifetimes, et cetera. So, you know, all of that throws up a lot of interesting information about you know the position of cannabis within societies and so on so i guess ultimately what we're trying to do with those with that system and you know those data sets is if we look at you know the role that we play within the tobacco industry let's say in terms of the data we produce it's to be that kind of like independent provider of information and you know, tobacco is obviously a very controversial space and there's a value there in, in having you know an independent view and i think what we'd like to do in, in the cannabis space is somewhat similar to that you know produce that cross comparable international data, you know, over time, hopefully tracking more and more cannabis markets as they come online and just providing that very clear view of, of what's happening within the cannabis space. You know, what are people's attitudes to the products he was using, you know, for what reasons, et cetera. And, and over time, you know, to really become that source of information that the industry itself can use to build products, to reach consumers, to advocate for itself that regulators can use to track, you know, the effect of regulation in different markets, you know, trends within consumer use, et cetera. So, you know, really to provide that, that information point from a, a neutral perspective, but from a perspective of kind of, you know, deep understanding of the industry, I guess, and empathy towards the, the growth of the industry as well. I would also add to that, that that is obviously the data side, which is hugely important, especially in a world that everything is so volatile and an industry that is so young and still in the process of coming of age. But we also have our own legacy perspectives, and that allows us to look at in this evolving industry like any other. So we can discuss brands, we can discuss cross-pollination with alcohol drinks, cross-pollination with beauty and personal care, or cross-pollination with tobacco, cross-pollination with uh, soft drinks. We can actually use this lenses from our experience of the last 15 years to look from the outside in cannabis instead of having this a problem that I've faced many times with uh, cannabis analysis that is uh, basically a lot of navel gazing. It's almost like it reminds me of uh, reading wine analysis. Wine specialists and uh, connoisseurs have, are legendary for that, you know, ignoring reality around them and just looking within. And I think that really steals some of the momentum of, of a critique. And I think that allows us to be, as, as, as uh, Shane suggested, as subjective as possible, but also add the, adding some value to the conversation and hopefully some imagination about where all of this conversation can go in the future. Yeah, I think it's essential. I mean, you know, things in isolation are meaningless. It's about context. And the reality of cannabis is that it intersects with many, many industries and which beautifully segues into the next section, which is going to talk about the areas that you guys are respectively kind of authorities on. So Shane, perhaps we start with you in terms of tobacco. Could you give us the general view of the tobacco industry on cannabis? And, you know, is it a threat or an opportunity? I think it's probably seen as the latter, but if you can elaborate on what you're seeing from the view from the tobacco space, that would be great. Yeah. So I think like, you know, like many people, like many things we've already touched on within the conversation, the view about cannabis from within the tobacco industry has changed a lot within the last, I would say, even two to three years. I think probably five years ago or so, it was viewed, and wider legalization was viewed very much more as a threat to the tobacco industry and the the framing through which the industry was looking at cannabis legalization was around that idea of a threat, you know, reputationally. I remember having, I think I may have mentioned this the last time I was on the show, but I remember very clearly having a conversation with a, a tobacco executive who was musing about whether the use of vaporization in, in cannabis would reflect badly on, on vaporization of nicotine, you know, from a reputational point of view. And I was trying to persuade this guy that the, it was actually, <laughs> if anything, it was the opposite that was the case. So, you know, the initial framing was, was quite defensive, but that has changed a lot in the last few years. I think as these companies have, have opened out, a couple of things have happened, you know, leaving aside cannabis perhaps, 
kind of adjacent to that, there's been a sort of structural change within the companies in terms of their strategies, where they're now have realized that they need to have another core of revenue as companies, you know, openly and explicitly now they're communicating with the investment community that they need to move beyond nicotine, as some of them call it quite explicitly. And that's not just something that's directed at, at cannabinoids or cannabis. It engages a range of different substances or product types or even services that these companies are now looking at. But for most of them, cannabis forms a big part of that. So I think the clearest example of that in the recent past is BAT, where they've gone from British American Tobacco, who've gone from having uh, very little involvement in the cannabis space, you know, being kind of consistent around being a tobacco and nicotine company to one that is now, you know, actively communicating around this idea of beyond nicotine, has invested in Organigram as a licensed producer, you know, but also invested or made investments in things like trade biosciences as well, which obviously is a company that that's he- you know heavily connected to the cannabinoid space and. You know, I think they've now internally, as far as I can see, have, have changed the, the view on cannabis to being one of very much an opportunity that that company wants to explore and develop and maximize. And I think, again, you know, maybe even more than that, where they feel that they can add value and develop the space in ways that existing companies that operate within it can't. So, yeah, from a tobacco point of view, really, it's kind of, you know, this is something that they want to develop. Are not clear to and and that's going across the companies now. You know, Philip Morris PMI, which is the biggest cigarette company in the world, had been quite resistant and reluctant to say anything publicly about cannabis. But again, even then, in the last twelve months, have begun to communicate openly around looking at things like CBD. You know, albeit maybe from a slightly more skeptical point of view or with with a slight more skepticism in terms of the tone that they're using around it. But but it's something that they're openly saying they're looking at. They de facto own a cannabis company now. They acquired Ferton Pharma, which has a subsidiary, Dankan, which is a medical cannabis company in Denmark. So, you know, there has been a lot of development in the last 12 months, and I expect to see more in the next 12 with, you know, more products coming on stream. I think that's what we've been lacking or missing so far is, you know, a lot of research and development, all the background work within the next sort of 12 months. I expect to see the cannabis or the tobacco companies launching cannabinoid products onto markets. Yeah. There's a few bits there. I mean, you mentioned a couple of the investments. Uh, are all of the big guys sort of taking it positions here? Because I know Imperial has put some money into, is it Oxley and a couple of others? Oxley and Oxford Cannabinoid Technologies as well, even before that. The one that's missing is Japan Tobacco. Japan, yeah. They have an issue in that they're 30% owned by the Japanese state. The Minister of Finance in Japan has to sign off <laughs> on anything like this. And, and given the kind of, yeah, given the situation in Japan at the moment, that's unlikely. So again, you know, I would suspect that, that it's something that they're looking at. I would suspect that they're sort of examining whether there's ways that can become involved that maybe doesn't require that kind of higher level consensus at this point in time. But they're the ones that are missing, but the others are pursuing it actively at the moment. Yeah. And in terms of products i mean as you kind of outlined as well tobacco is or the tobacco industry and the companies involved in it are now obviously much more than just cigarette manufacturers is vaping is obviously going to be a key kind of crossover area as well i suppose potentially i think the format question is is probably the one that they're looking at the moment and actually it's it's an interesting one from the tobacco space. You know, Spurs will talk in a moment about the AD companies. And I think it's very obvious that a, a beverage company will go into and try to develop cannabis beverages. I think the the format read across from nicotine isn't as clear in this case. You know, if you look at the, the product, to put it simply, that tobacco companies are best known for the combustible cigarette. You know, the analogy or the, the closest comparison within the cannabis space is a combination of flour and, and perhaps pre-roll. You know, those are, if you look at, any adult use market, let's say that's probably what 60, 70% of the market at this time, right? And those are formats that I would argue tobacco companies can't go into <laughs> because of the combustion uh, that happens there. And, you know, they're communicating on the nicotine business that combustion is an issue. That's the thing that causes cancer, et cetera. And it's, it's a very difficult message for them, I think, to then go across and start selling combustible cannabis products. So they are looking at what formats heat not burn though heat not burn is probably well that's where i was going to go there's a really interesting product amura i know mike was on your at this podcast recently he did mention you get you got in touch with him actually. yeah yeah <laughs> so we we had a nice chat but I, you know that's certainly the type of product i think that tobacco companies will be looking at really really closely and 
you know, in a sort of broader sense, this idea of maybe reinventing inhalation and looking at where they can kind of bring across that existing expertise, that existing product set and, and sort of reapply it to the cannabis space. But I think, you know, they'll also be looking at other formats as well. So I think, you know, the edible space is one that would be very interesting to them. You know, perhaps formats like shots and, and shorter kind of beverage formats, you know, where they may see that there's an analogy in terms of the way people will use the, the product. So it's not just the form factor, but things like the frequency which 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 people might use something, you know, the way someone might use it, if that's analogous to their existing product set, uh, then that's area, you know, those areas that they'll look at, I think. Yeah, there's a lot more we could go into onto that, but to give Spiros his moment, let's move it on to alcohol and actually maybe you could do sort of same sort of stuff from the perspective of the alcohol industry. Well, I think, as you said, we would talk for the next couple of hours about cannabis of huge beverages anyway, but I'm, I'm going to try to summarize everything very quickly. For the ones that are not familiar with it for any reason, I mean, I guess everyone listening to us now has an idea about how close these two industries has been in the last couple of years anyway. I think the, the starting point should be the fact that the vast majority of alcohol companies in the last half a decade at least are transitioning into perceiving themselves as total beverage companies. And that means moving into directions outside of their comfort zones, outside of their individual little bottles if you wish, or cans or whatever they are using for their liquids. So it is a process of evolution that is happening beyond cannabis. And cannabis is just part of this holistic puzzle that fits very nicely to the kind of strategic direction that they were moving anyway. The second point to, to keep in mind is the, um, the fact that the vast majority of younger people these days are drinking less than our generation. We were talking earlier, Anusha, how we're getting older. I think... There is a generational gap and there is a generational transition into caring about one's health much more. Some would say to the levels of obsession. Some could suggest that this has to do more with panopticon society that we live in and how we project and brand ourselves online with our social media and the photos everywhere. But younger people in general are drinking less and they care about how they will look when they drink and they care how they will look the next morning, how they drink. And if a photo from a drunken night out might resurface a decade later, creating problems in their career. I know it sounds sad for anyone over 40, but that is the reality out there. All of that, of course, means that alcohol companies themselves have to start thinking beyond alcohol. Uh, much like Shane described earlier, how tobacco companies have to start thinking beyond tobacco. So there is a very clear parallel there. That is the environment, and that is why in a context that uh, alcohol consumption is actually declining, people are drinking less but better, at least in the Western world, in the emerging market, still growing, but it's growing, basically transitioning from unbranded products to some branded products. But overall, it's, it's definitely a value growth story in alcohol, not a volume story, really growth anymore. That means then diversification was essential and the cannabis was providing an answer to the question that was going beyond what cannabis was asking. So it would happen. Of course, it would happen. And it started happening. Now, that is something that I agree with. And I've been saying from four or five years ago, before Constellation made that first historic move. The problem over the last couple of years, and kind of continue to your question, is that many of these companies invested huge amounts into M&A without necessarily, in my mind, actually allowing internally to, for the creativity and brand building exercises to, to create these brands that would then make these investments worthwhile. We've seen massive amounts of money squandered. I think some of them most likely had to happen anyway because of research and development. I have to remind our listeners, the first generation of these um, cannabis beverages were tasting more or less horrible. The THC and CBD content was hit and miss, was very difficult to verify. In many cases, it started actually sticking to the, the can lining inside, so it wasn't actually you know, being passed to the consumer. The onset, which was a massive question and the offset of the effect, essentially how quickly the consumer would actually feel any effect in the beginning was one, one and a half hour. It's only now recently with nano emulsification and different technologies started to come lower and be comparable with other beverages. The pricing continues to be very high, which makes it problematic when competing against other formats. The lack of on-trade establishments, for our listeners that are not familiar with the term, it's essentially bars, restaurants, and uh, clubs, are still very minimal and only in some U.S. states. Essentially, the on-trade 
a bar, a club, any social environment for consumption are a core bastion, are a pillar of what makes an alcoholic drink successful or not. And to the extent that until now, we didn't have the opportunity for these products to actually capitalize on this kind of social environment, again, they, they were not really able to build this equity that is essential in a world that is changing so fast. So, yes, cannabis answers many of the questions, potentially more questions to be posed as well in the future, considering the declining or saturated growth for alcoholic drinks. But at the same time, many mistakes were made, many investments that shouldn't have been made. I'm not entirely sure buying craft distilleries across the U.S. in the hope that in three to five years, full federal legalization will take place and then that craft brand can be utilized to then build a cannabis beverage is actually the best investing way to go about it instead of just creating a new beverage since, you know, it's all new anyway. So while strategically, I think that cannabis will inevitably, and I'm 100% certain about that, will become one with alcoholic drinks as I predicted five years ago, and it's already ongoing, and they are intricately connected in their future. At the same time, I am extremely critical about this kind of let's buy everything approach that many of the major MSOs have approached in the last couple of years, mostly targeting investors rather than actually targeting consumers, rather than actually targeting brands to be created and build brand equity. Yeah. And maybe that is a function of the stage of maturity of the market and the players within it. I mean, in terms of the investments, you obviously mentioned Constellation and, and Canopy. That's obviously a big one. Can Just for the audience, can you name a few of the other sort of alcoholic forays into this space? I mean, historically, uh, years ago, the biggest craft brewery, one of the most famous craft breweries in California has been Lagunitas. It belongs to Heineken. They have come out with their own cannabis beverage already two or three years ago. Most on course has been increasingly active with, obviously, in Canada, but they are trying to bring the true beverages to the U.S., utilizing the CBD as a, I don't want to use the, the term Trojan horse, but I, I can say as an introduction to their audiences to, to start building this all elusive uh, brand equity that I, I, I talked about. We have distribution companies in the U.S. that have historically been associated with alcoholic drinks, now starting to distribute cannabis products as well. For me, a less known, a less discussed little corner of this, which is not entirely something that's happening right now, but I can see the potential, is the fact that Drizzly, the biggest alcohol delivery platform in the U.S., has some kind of association with, and also the same founders, created Lantern, which is one of the major cannabis distribution platforms in the U.S. as well. And because Drizzly was acquired by Uber in the beginning of this year for $1 billion, as you can imagine, it's, it's a separate entity from London, but it's the same people and has been implicitly alluded to that, you know, once federal legalization was to take place, then Uber could potentially also start becoming active with London, as they did with Disney. Again, creating a... Rinse and repeat, I think, is the phrase. Yes, I mean, essentially creating the chemos, getting ready for this kind of federal legalization. And I have no doubt that home consumption and home delivery and this convenience factor of apps that we all get got quite used to as we were stuck in our bunkers for the last two years, this will become an essential part of this conversation. So the marriage, if you wish, between alcoholic drinks and cannabis has largely already happened. The only ones that are not really active there yet are major wine and major spirits companies. I think there is a little bit more complacency and a little bit more inherent conservatism when it comes to these, primarily because they think that their demographics, since they are a bit older, they would not be really the ones to be impacted by this. I think I find that a bit myopic and short-sighted. I think it might be true in the short term, and I do believe that there is a higher correlation to beer with cannabis because of the younger demographics, because of the fact that, you know, the 20 to 35-year-old demographic is most likely to, to be also cannabis consumers or at least open to it. But I think... At the same time, if we look at the U.S. and which are the, the demographic cohorts that are actually growing the fastest in a legal framework right now in the last couple of years, it's actually boomers and older senior consumers that are growing the fastest. And these historically are the, you know, the core of wine and spirits consumption. So I would think that even these companies would inevitably have to start looking into it in the next couple of years. I think there is a bit of a pushback. They are, they have one eye on it, but spirits are doing really well. Again, the complacency factor that I mentioned about politics works in business as well. You know, if you're doing really well, you really don't have any major reasons to majorly rock the boats. Uh, beer, 
being very saturated and largely declining in the Western world for the last couple of years does have a reason to do that. There are a couple of interesting brands, though. I mean, Artes in that space, that kind of spirit space is a very interesting brand, I think. I saw recently they've released a kind of strain-specific variant or whatever, you know, so again, that kind of varietal type of idea, cultivar type of idea coming in. I would add, there is a couple of, a couple of them. I mean, Khan as well in the, in the US seems to be pushing all the right buttons. I think it's increasingly proven that THC content in beverages will be extremely polarized. So it will be a story of, uh, or a narrative of two polar opposites. On the one hand, you will have the very high THC products that are targeting connoisseurs, consumers that are really well versed in cannabis, and they want something that actually encapsulates this buzz that is long lasting, really hard, and they know what they're going for. That's, I would make a parallel with single malt whiskey, perhaps, if you wish. Uh, yes, something really like that. And on the other hand, and I think that's also hugely important, is the very low THC content. Uh, the parallel I would make is something similar to hard seltzers or low ABV non or low alcohol products that are extremely successful in around, around the world in the last couple of years. So Cannes seems to be targeting that, you know, to, to MG demographic lifestyle associations, celebrity culture, uh, Instagrammable positioning, a very colorful and very accessible, non-intimidating little can that you can carry with you conveniently. You know, all of these little factors are coming together. And I think similar to uh, what Shane suggested, I think I would also add can to this very, still very short list of products. Yeah. And I think for me, that second category is the one that really helps to broaden this out because Otherwise, you're sort of slightly preaching to the converted who are already familiar with cannabis and like it strong and however else they want it. You're broadening it out to kind of to new demographics is the exciting bit, I think, personally. And, and very interesting, you picked up on uh, and you talked about the fact that there has been substantial product development in this and actual focus on producing a great tasting product whereas initially i think probably everyone just thought i just need to stick some weed in it somehow it doesn't even matter if it the famed uh, bonk water flavor profile. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly exactly so now people are actually thinking about you know let's make this something that people are going to enjoy and come back to so thank you guys for those sort of very brief summaries we could really go into a lot more detail there and um, maybe if we can broaden this out for the last part just to sort of taking your specific alcohol and tobacco hats off and just your general perspectives on how are you seeing the development of cannabis products and maybe if we can split this into wellness and recreational and one of you take the other i often find that these two things are slightly blurred and my example of this is that i think throughout the pandemic and especially in our household the phrase I have a glass of wine at 5 p.m. because it just takes the edge off. That was a very frequently uttered phrase. And that is a blur between recreational and wellness, isn't it? Because you're talking about something that sort of has a mental health perspective to it as much as anything else. So I don't know which one, do one of you want to kick off with wellness maybe and then... I can kick off with your answer to this, first of all, and just a clarification that I know that what you said is true to an extent, but that's the thing with statistics. I've had this conversation in the last couple of years many, many times with uh, countless journalists that famously tend to over-imbibe at the best of times, even more so during the global apocalypse. So they came to the, I have to say, wrong conclusion that everyone was doing the same. And that is something that we have to be very clear when it comes to alcohol. Overall, if you look at total alcohol sales during the pandemic, alcohol declined the most it has in the last century. Wow. So it's very important. I have to, I have to always clarify. You heard it here first, I, I, I have, guys. Have, you heard it here have, first. I have to always clarify this. <laughs> now, what happened was that we took out the on-trade. That's what I mentioned, the importance of the on-trade. And on-trade is? The, just the to, bars, to going, going to bars, going to restaurants, going, going to clubs. And because this is such a significant amount of, uh, of sales, then even having this extra glass at home was not making enough for the losses of the three glasses that you would have had with your friends in the pub. So that is one thing that we have to always clarify when we talk about recreation, health and wellness and, and all that. Now, at the same time, I, I will also add another statistics. And, and we know that, for example, over the last year in the US and in Canada, during the lockdowns, cannabis actually saw double digit growth because it was a product that was anyway only consumed in the off trade. There was no... They didn't lose one of their major distribution avenues. It was, it was People were not allowed to drink on trade anyway, to smoke on trade. So we were stuck at home and there was a significant increase in the sales of cannabis because that proved to be the ideal substance, if you wish, that actually would allow people this kind of you know golden balance between health and wellness and recreation. 
Now, in my mind, and I think that's what I kind of alluded to earlier, the alcohol companies are, as I said, moving increasingly towards a total beverage direction. And that, by definition, then means that they will incorporate a spectrum of products that has to cover all these bases. So they will have, starting from the CBD, and I would I would add to that not just CBD, minor cannabinoids, added mushrooms and other psychotropic uh, substances, minor psychotropic that could actually have beneficial effects. And then this spectrum ranging all the way to pure recreation. I think that is the way I see at least the beverage side uh, of things evolving. And with that, I would also add companies like Coke, Coca-Cola, for example, have started for the first time in many, many decades to actually produce alcoholic products. I don't know if you're listeners are familiar. That's another sign from the other side of the spectrum. So it's not that just alcohol companies that are getting into total beverages and have a, a full spectrum of solutions, but actually non-alcoholic drinks that are getting into alcohol. And I would then, to end with this, I would then think that they are starting to get more open to things beyond alcohol as well, both for recreation and for health and wellness reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I mean... In some ways, it's a hard question to answer, I suppose. It, it's, you know, it's something, it relates to a lot of things that we talk about, I think, around the cannabis space, like the distinction between wellness and recreation itself is, is a very reductive one, I think. And almost in, in some senses does a disservice, I think, to the cannabis plant in itself. Like we often talk in other contexts around the way people communicate and advocate around legalization. And, and there's often this sometimes inadvertent, I think, distinction between made between good cannabis users who are maybe ill you know, are using explicitly within a, a medical context or whatever, you know, compared to quote unquote bad cannabis users who are, are just using it to get high or just using it because, you know, th that's what they like to do or whatever. And I think, you know, there's much more of a, a spectrum here. It's much more multi-layered. I mean, even from a recreational point of view, there's a lot of different things that could be going on in someone's life or in someone's kind of motivations at any one, one point in time and so on. So I think, you know, what interests us or what interests me around product development within the cannabis space is the extent to which companies can, you know, become more sophisticated, I guess, around the way that they're targeting not just different types of users, but different types of occasions, different types of drivers. You know, again, I think once we get into legal frameworks where there isn't a legal distinction between CBD and THC as well, because I think sometimes that distinction between wellness and recreation just becomes a proxy for you know, this is a CBD product uh, or this is where we can legally release a THC product. But once you're in those frameworks, I think there's more interesting things that companies can do around, you know, the mix not only of different cannabinoids, but as we also said, other substances as well. That's, you know, a big area that we're seeing starting to emerge, obviously, is the inclusion of other substances alongside um, cannabinoids as well. So the involvement of tobacco nicotine alcohol hopefully other types of companies as well can i think you know move this along because there's a tradition there of, of segmenting consumers understanding consumer drivers understanding you know the mindsets of people as they're using products and not just kind of shifting people into buckets of either wellness users or recreational users or whatever it might be so that kind of you know more sophisticated segmentation i think is something that you know given we're at the end of the beginning now is something that i think we should and, and we'll begin to see more of within the cannabis space and almost move beyond to the distinction we talked about in terms of either wellness or recreation and looking at a, a broader spectrum of different product propositions you know usage occasions etc yeah brilliant way to kind of end the show actually because I think you're right. I think it does get reduced to it's effectively a proxy between CBD and THC, isn't it? And the reality is there should probably be a bit of both in any of these products to make them more effective. But again, there are so many topics we could continue here. Guys, I'm really, really chuffed to get you both back on the show. And as I mentioned before, I'm going to be doing some more panels. And so I'm really hoping that you can join a few of those over the next year or so. So uh, thanks again for joining me. Absolutely. It was a real pleasure. I, I would end with the hope and I think it's a pragmatic hope right now that the first green shoots popping up next to us in Germany in the next one or two years, might be three, might be one and a half. I don't think it's really making such a huge difference in the timeline when it comes to that. But there's something big about to happen. And my hope is that may this be the domino effect that will finally start this process that we have been discussing for a few years 
And then finally, we can start discussing this industry like any other industry, without uh, metaphysics, without over-optimism or over-pessimism, just like any other industry, in order for it to unleash this massive potential that we all know for both medical and for recreational and for everything in, in between. No good or bad cannabis, just cannabis for all. And with that, we can end. Yes, a beautiful way to end it. <laughs> yeah, awesome. That, that was amazing. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Spiros. Thank you, Shane. I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Take care, Anish. It was an absolute pleasure. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast. It will help me spread the good word on how this amazing industry is developing. I work with various cannabis startups to help them get funded and grow. I also work with corporates and international cannabis companies to help them understand and navigate the European cannabis sector. We're working with some great clients across the cannabis value chain and we'd love to help you too. Please visit www.canverse.global to get in touch.